Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to this Carnegie Endowment conversation about the global landscape of democracy and autocracy. My name is Saskia Brechenmacher. I am a fellow in the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I will be moderating this conversation here today. So it is my pleasure to be joined by two people who I think it is fair to say are among the world's really most distinguished experts on democracy. Um, Professor Stefan Lindberg of the University of Gothenburg and the VDEM Institute in Sweden, and Thomas Carruthers of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome to you both, and thank you for joining. Now, as many of you likely already know, uh, we find ourselves in a really troubling moment for global democracy. The political liberalization and democratization that we witnessed in so many countries around the world towards the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century has really come to a halt. Instead, we're seeing increasing backsliding and reversals in some of the world's most visible and significant democracies like India, Brazil, the United States, but also in many smaller countries across different regions, right? like Serbia, Guinea, for example. And the flip side of that phenomenon, of course, is that autocracy has made a strong comeback. And in fact, there's even some evidence that the nature of autocratization is increasingly changing and that many autocracies are becoming more repressive, right? We only have to look at what's been happening in Russia over the past two months to, to see that trend. The implications for global order, for global governance, for state society relations, for human rights are really momentous and significant. And so the goal of our conversation here today is to dig a bit deeper into these trends and patterns. What do global patterns of autocratization actually look like? Um, what do they tell us about the nature of this trend? Do we actually have a theory of the drivers of what is causing democratic backsliding and autocratization to explain this phenomenon? And what are the implications for those of us interested in defending democracy around the world? So to help us answer some of these questions, I'm really delighted to welcome Stefan Lindberg, who is a professor of political science at the University of Gothenburg, as I mentioned, um, and the founding director of the VDEM Institute. Now, for those of you who don't know, VDEM or the Varieties of Democracy Project is an extremely ambitious and uh, comprehensive global data collection effort focused on both conceptualizing and measuring the different dimensions of democracy in countries around the world and over time using expert insights. And he'll be sharing some of the latest findings from VDEM's annual report about the global state of democracy and autocracy. And then responding to and reflecting on Stefan's comments, um, we have Tom Carruthers, who is the Senior Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment. He is also the co-director of the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program. Um, at Carnegie, and of course, a longstanding scholar and analyst of democracy, as well as international democracy support. And most recently has done quite a bit of cross-national research on political polarization in particular. So he'll be sharing some of his own insights and reflections. So a few, few notes on the order um, of events. Um, we'll start off with a presentation by Stefan. Um, I will then call on Tom to respond and they will have a bit of a back and forth um, reflecting on um, the latest VDEM report um, and its broader implications. Um, we will have some time for a Q&A at the very end. Um, and so if you do have a question while you're listening to the conversation, please do submit it to the chat and I'll try my best to help feed it into the conversation um, at the end. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Stefan to kick us off. Thank you so much, Saiska. Saiska. And uh, thanks to you and to Thomas for, for inviting me to be part of this event. Uh, it's my, my great pleasure. Um, so uh, I'll give you just the highlights of the VDEM Institute Democracy Report 2022, Autocratization Changing Nature, question mark. Um, and if we could get the slide uh, slides to be up, thank you. Um, it has three parts, and I'm just gonna give a few highlights uh, from each of the three parts. The first part, the state of the world uh, in 2021. <clears throat> we are back to 1989 levels in terms of 
uh, global democracy by our count. And now 70% of the world population live in autocracies. How does the evidence look like? Well, it looks like this. Here's the liberal democracy index weighted for population size because we think that democracy is ruled by the people, right? And therefore it matters how many people are affected by a certain level of democracy. So the world average here in the middle uh, with a black line and the confidence intervals around it, you can think of that as that's the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen. And if we draw a red line back in time, like there, um, it takes us back to 80, 1989, the end of the Cold War, even before that. That entire explosion almost of political rights, civil liberties, freedoms, uh, not only in the former Soviet Union, but across Asia and Africa and so on, that took place after the end of the Cold War has been eradicated at the global scale. I think that should put things in perspective for where we are at. We can also translate these um, <clears throat> into um, and look into different regime types. And then we see that dictatorships, the pure dictatorships, are also on the rise. Uh, here's how the evidence looks like. The same underlying indicators just translated into regime categories instead. And here going back to 1971, and you see the red line here starting with 87, this uh, decisive drop in really uh, the close autocracies, the really bad dictatorships, uh, down to 20 at a point and now rising again up to 30 by our last count. Um, and meanwhile, the number of liberal democracies are going down uh, now from 42 at its height down to 34. Together, the two types of autocracies here, closed and electoral autocracies, um, make only not only a majority of, of countries in the world, but also harbor 70% of the world population. And this has real uh, 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 implications, right? Um, I'm just going to highlight this area from our Case for Democracy project that we did uh, over the past one and a half years. There is so much research showing that clear relationship between democracy and armed conflict, both with regard to interstate wars and with other types of uh, armed conflicts. Not only India, with its uh, backsliding of the past six years or so, uh, there, the risk with uh, an armed conflict with Pakistan has increased by 300%, um, according to these studies, right? But also look at Russia, sliding down <clears throat> after Putin comes into power on that uh, uh, democracy scale. And then the, the slope there is the estimated probability for uh, Russia engaging in an armed conflict. And we see the result very vividly today in, in Europe. Now, all that is in also in a policy brief that is available on our website that sort of cites all the rigorous research on in in this area. Now, so that's sort of the the first highlights from the first part of the report, um, and then in the second part of the report, uh, we look at the countries that are actually right now in change. <clears throat> Unfortunately we find a record of 33 countries autocratizing. That's a record over the past 50 years. Here's the evidence for that. Again, from 1971, the blue line, the number of countries democratizing each year. And look at that in the mid, late 1990s, 72 countries democratizing at the same time. That's when we were all happy. We all enjoyed the world and we were looking forward to a bright future. And then that slope has just plummeted down to 15. And it's only about 3% of the world population living in those 15 countries. Meanwhile, starting with Putin in Russia and Venezuela, uh, Chavez in Venezuela, um, the number of autocratizing countries have been going up and what we call the third wave of autocratization up to 33 by our count at the end of 2021. And this is really serious because um, we've looked at this is from a scientific publication that um, came out last year. Um, we looked at all episodes of autocratization starting in democracies from 1900 and to the present. And almost 80% of them led to breakdown of democracy. So just the statistical probability here 
that countries now autocratizing will survive as democracies is really low. Um, and also to guess, give you a sense of, in our data, how now all areas of democracy is, are, are affected. Look at this. Here is in 2011, different components of democracy, indices for that, and whether they are advancing or declining in countries. So, or if you're above the line here, this, all these components were advancing, getting better in more countries than they were declining. Uh, most of all, then still clean elections, advancing in 29 countries. Um, and then compare that. That's only 10 years ago. And look at this visual now with 2021. Boom. They are all below the line. And worst of all, their freedom of expression. We also have freedom of the media. So it's really um, a, a dramatic change that's happened in the, also in the, just the past 10 years. Uh, who are the major autocratizers? Here they are, the top 10, um, <clears throat> where they were all democracies in 2011. And seven out of the 10 today are not counted as democracies anymore, including Hungary and India, that were media freedom, academic freedom, organizational freedom, civil society, and so on, and attacks on the judiciary, and so on have gone so far that they can no longer be counted as democracies. Um, in addition to this, we're noting this year that EU may be facing its own wave. 20% of the EU members are now in a, what we see as statistically significant and substantial uh, autocratization. Here they are, Hungary and Poland, we all know about that. They've been going on for a while. Recently in the last two, three years, Slovenia, has had a quite substantial uh, decline on the liberal democracy index to a much lesser degree, but still statistically significant, Croatia, Czech Republic, and Greece. And then you have the neighbors on the eastern flank um, uh, that are not democracies, and, but still in decline. So this is worrying for us. Um, I think also in the in the present moment, and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna come back to that in the, in the, in the discussion here. Then we think there are some additional signs beyond this sort of increasing uh, number of dictatorships and now all areas of, of uh, democracy being affected. And uh, we think there are additional signs of autocrats and wannabe autocrats are becoming more bold and taking more decisive actions. Among them, a year of coups. So uh, in 2021, we had six successful coups, five military coups, and, and then the, the self-coup or autogolpe in, in, in Tunisia. And then in addition, there were a few um, failed coups. And this is a sharp break. We're not sure this is gonna go on, but, but it seems to us as one indication that they care less about what the international community thinks. They are less concerned with sort of uh, being condemned for not being in the in the sort of group of countries holding elections and all that anymore. In addition, the wave of polarization is now engulfing so many countries and reaching really toxic levels. Uh, the kinds you know uh, from the United States, where the opponents are, are portrayed, at least in the rhetoric, as being a threat to our nation or our way of life. Uh, and <clears throat> therefore, you can start to justify limiting their rights and freedoms, and in the end, uh, uh, justify political violence. That's the sort of the extreme of this. Here's just a visual of that. If you're above the line here, then polarization has gotten substantially and statistically significantly worse in the last 10 years. And you see the number of countries there, and also, if you're in sort of the upper third here, then you're reaching toxic levels that are these really um, uh, 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 dangerous for democracy. Right? Um, and this goes hand in hand with autocratization and forms sort of a vicious cycle, if you like. Um, here's just an example with five of the top autocratizers. And for each one of them, three indicators of uh, polarization, uh, and they go up 
and then the liberal democracy index goes down. Um, political leaders, wannabe autocrats, have learned how to use polarization to reach toxic levels so that you can portray opponents as somehow a threat to our society, to our way of life, to our nation, and then justify, use that to justify institutional reforms and increasing oppression of opposition. Uh, so there, this is not a coincidence, and it's not only these five countries, it's, it's a very general pattern. In addition here, uh, misinformation or disinformation, if you like. Um, not only autocratic governments, but also wannabe autocratic governments increasingly use misinformation. Um, and we think this is an, also a, a signal of, of emboldened autocrats. Um, here is just one of the indicators, uh, government's uh, spread of misinformation domestically um, that has gone up in the world quite substantially um, over the past 20 years, and also in all the regions, the MENA, worst of all, um, but, but closely followed by the other regions, Western Europe and North America, a little less, um, uh, mainly driven by North America, uh, United States, of course, but uh, we also see signs of this elsewhere. Um, so this is uh, really a worrying trend that also seems to us is, is a part of this changing nature of autocratization, that it's becoming more bold, more decisive, and, and less sort of carry, they care less about what the democracies and the international community thinks. Um, <clears throat> so those are the highlights from this year's Democracy Report, Autocratization Changing Nature. It's available from our website. Here's the new website, the new design. Uh, you can download uh, not only the Democracy Report there, but of course, all the data, the documentation, working papers, policy briefs, and so on. We also have these uh, fun, or we, uh, at least we think they're fun, graphing tools. If you don't want to download 30 million data and play around with them in Stata or R or something else, then you can still access all the data through the graphing tools, graph your country or compare countries and so on. And on that, let me say thank you for listening and um, look forward to the conversation here. Thank you so much, Stefan, for this really concise but rich overview. I think there's a lot here to dig into. Um, so over to you, Tom, for some initial reflections and responses. Thank you, Saskia. Since the beginning of the VDEM project, I've been tremendously impressed by the depth of the research work, the comprehensiveness, and often innovativeness, and of course, the rigor. It's a project that really is pathbreaking in what it's done. And the 2022 report is just one more example of the quality and utility of VDEM's work. So Stefan, I congratulate you and your colleagues on this report, but on the, the larger endeavor in which you're engaged. Now that I've finished buttering you up, let me see if I can ask a few harder questions about uh, what you're doing here. Is uh, actually, <clears throat> I do have a few questions that are a bit of sort of trying to poke a little bit at your findings, to, it, at least for me to understand them a bit better, because there are a few things that you know, I'll confess made me scratch my head a little, um, but also just to bring out some of the nuance and detail that you've talked about in a very summary presentation here. Let's start with the overall finding that you present that back to 1989. You know, I'm, I'm all for a cold shower on uh, the state of global democracy. It's bad, no question about that. So there's no, no dispute about that. But the back to 1989 tagline of your report, it's grabbing, gets your attention. And I understand the statistical basis for it. But sometimes statistical bases provide taglines that, that I think may not be, don't, it didn't quite persuade me in the following way. Um, because with the back to 1989, back to 1989 kind of implies that, that nothing good that was achieved post-1989 still remains kind of there's a or or it were you know we've lost almost everything that was gained and when i look at the world it doesn't really correspond to what i see so if i take central and eastern europe <clears throat> it certainly has a discouraging backsliding in hungary and slovenia and poland but central europe today is much freer much more pluralistic than it was in 1989. if i look at the former soviet union of course, only parts of it are very pluralistic. Georgia, Armenia a bit, Kyrgyzstan a little bit, Moldova, Ukraine, to fact. Um, 
Um, but certainly the former Soviet Union, you know, in 1991 was a very repressive place without anything like that degree of pluralism. Sub-Saharan Africa, 1989, Nigeria was still under military rule. South Africa was uh, still in apartheid. Ethiopia was still under military leadership. Zambia was under one party rule. Sub-Saharan Africa is much more pluralistic today than it was. Even the Middle East, hardly a, a region of pluralism today, uh, has certainly Morocco, Jordan, Libya actually, um, even Tunisia is certainly less repressive than it was in 1989. So when I, I look around, I, I, I don't quite get the idea that we've gone all the way back to 1989. And I'm wondering, is, is the use of India, the fact that India has shifted categories and has 1.4 billion people, isn't that what makes the line go back to 1989? But if you took out India and said, let's look at the world outside of India, there've been some quite substantial gains. So help me understand this. Um, no, I think it's, 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 it's more than a fair reflection. Um, and I, I, I share the, 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 the concern or the, the, I share the, the view. I mean, there are, obviously, there are countries in Central East and Europe, in Africa and elsewhere uh, that you mentioned that, that are better off today um, uh, still than they were in 1989. Um, and, and I could add to that list with, with some countries. Um, um, I mean, take seashells, but seashells also ha only have 90,000 people, right? Um, and, and it's not only India. Um, it's also countries like Brazil. It's also the United mm -hmm. States uh, th that's uh, uh, slid down. Um, so, but I, but I think I think sort of in in a report like this, uh, I think the there is there is an important message in terms of, and I think it's fair to say that we're back at 1989 levels if we look at the global average adjusted for population size, how in terms of what the average global citizen enjoys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but but that that of course is a is 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 at some level a, a huge generalization, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and there are there are there are many countries that are better off, and then there but there are also countries that are worse off. And it's not only India driven this. Although of course, uh, India's backsliding here uh, with 1.4 billion people um, plays uh, or 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 accounts for for a, a big portion of, of, of this um, population adjusted. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's- No, I'm, yeah, I think that, I think what I'm worried about Stefan is, you know, I live in the Washington policy community mm -hmm. where debates over not just the state of democracy, but the overall endeavor by the United States and many other uh, democratic countries to support democracy in the last 30 or 40 years is in question. And a tagline like that, I think to some extent plays well into the eyes, hands, and minds of some people who would say, see, it's all been a waste of time. We tried after 1989, we invested in all these programs and everything. You know what? Stefan says we're back to that zero. We got zero for outcomes. And I think that would be unfortunate if people took your, actually what I understand is the statistically based and also nuanced conclusion, because it sounds like something that it, I don't think quite is. So I guess that's why I'm I'm poking at this a bit because I, I yeah, think, yeah it's, it's it's concerned to me that you led with this finding as a way of sort of characterizing the state of the world because I see at least in my world that it plays right into one end of a policy debate that says that was all a waste of time. Mm. That's not really what you're saying, is it? No, I'm I mean, I'm not saying that we're uh, that we are back to zero um, for in all countries. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but at but at the global level, uh, mm -hmm. we are, and yeah. I I think I think one of the one of the points here is sort of before we started with this population weighted uh, regional and world averages, um, most were used to only look at uh, averages that were based on on uh, the level of democracy in each country and divided by number of countries, and and then. It's that's also, I think another uh, could. I mean, it's it it shows something different, but it can also be misleading, because then you're saying, okay, what level of democracy you have in the seashells with ninety thousand inhabitants, um, 
means as much for the world as the level of democracy you have in India for the 1.4 billion people there. And I think that's also misleading, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. or, well, at least yeah. it's it, they, these are two supplementary pictures, at least. Yeah, but that. you're choosing two cases of the extreme, Seychelles versus India, whereas I'm saying if I look at the region of Central and Eastern Europe, I'd say compared to January 1st, 1989, it's a much freer, much more pluralist. Oh, it's not yeah. just Seychelles, so is Nigeria, so is, you know, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, so is parts of the former. So it is, I think you're, you're stretching the comparison a little bit again and saying, you know, there are significant regions of the world that are much better off in democratic terms today than they were in 1989. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. yes, India, yes, Brazil, and yes, the United States are very disappointing, but that's mm. not Let's go to the next one. I have not been to the University of Gothenburg as a student, but you must be hard graders there. <laughs> because I was looking at the report carefully and only 34 countries are categorized as liberal democracy. Yep. And I thought, wow, you know, fewer than one in six countries in the world, that's tough. And so I looked a bit and I was surprised that Austria is not a liberal democracy, that Portugal is not a liberal democracy, the Czech Republic is not a liberal democracy, South Africa is not a liberal democracy, Ghana is not a liberal democracy. Tell us about your grading system. Students are yep. failing. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Portugal. We 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 put in a little uh, footnote on Portugal because Portugal is really on the 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 border, and it's a little tweak. It's it's it it could. At, I mean, every time you you make categorizations like this based on a wealth of information, you have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and it's not completely arbitrary, of course, where you draw the line, because uh, th there is a sort of a reasonable span of where you can draw the line. Mm -hmm. um, but you could draw it. So, so I wouldn't make too much out of Portugal, but uh, uh, South Africa, definitely. Um, uh, when when we grade for, and I yes, I am a hard grader. My, the, your, my students would tell you that. <laughs> but uh, um, we, we set the standard pretty high for, uh, becoming a liberal democracy. So not only do you need to have all the electoral democracy, which also includes a fair amount of freedom of, of the media and freedom of expression and freedom of association to be an electoral democracy. Um, but then we we look at three areas for liberal democracy and, and one is the sort of the civil liberties and, and, and individual rights. Um, and, and that those are enforced and guaranteed uh, uh, equally for all to a sufficient degree. But also the executive, the checks of the executive by the legislature, that the legislature is really independent, uh, opposition parties really have um, uh, a possibility to hold the, um, the, the um, executive to account uh, and that they do it when called for. Um, and, and that's one area, obviously, where, where the United States suffered in our ratings a lot in the last few years. Um, but also the judiciary, uh, that the judiciary remains autonomous and independent and from the executive. Um, so it's, it's a, primarily in those three areas that these countries that you mentioned uh, fail um, or not are not good enough, if I put it that way, rather. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. One piece, it's not exactly good news in the report, but a, a sort of a dog that didn't bark, in the, mm -hmm. if I can use that expression, yeah. uh, was the pandemic. It, it notes yeah. in the report that the global pandemic did not, let me see, I have the report here, um, did, had limited direct effect on democracy. I think when the pandemic hit, you know, I know I was, a lot of us were very uncertain about, you know, what kind of medium to long-term effects it would have on the global state of democracy. Tell us a little bit about that finding. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also surprising to me to some extent. I was, I was really worried um, because we know from history that this, the, the kinds of measures that the pandemic opened up for state of emergency uh, of different kinds have often also in democracies been used prolonged sometimes over decades and used for other purposes than they were initially sort of designed for and can be used to purge opposition or at least uh, intimidate opposition and, and so on. Um, so we worried about this. So we, we, we had this um, project that we call the pandemic backsliding project over one and a half years into uh, last of June last year. And um, 
uh, with funding from the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I should acknowledge, and and uh, we tracked to what extent uh, countries violated the international UN uh, UN Human Rights Commission norms on uh, what you're allowed to do in face of a pandemic. Um, but we found that in our analysis that um, the yeah there were some democracies that violated these norms um but they have mostly been pulled back in democracies and it's the already autocratizing countries um including countries like hungary and poland um that that sort of used the pandemic as a pretext for uh further autocratization further restrictions on media freedom and and so on uh, but it wasn't really causal in that sense. It, in, it, it seemed that they were already doing these things. They were already in decline. Mm. On the margins, they could do a little bit more. And some autocracies could make sort of their control systems of citizens even tighter um, with digital tracking uh, of different kinds and so on. Um, but it wasn't really causing much of uh, sort of mm -hmm. autocratization. And and that's mm -hmm. sort of the point we, we yeah. want to... Yeah, well, I think it's an important conclusion. It's interesting. Two more sort of points I want to raise, and uh, one medium one and one larger one. Medium one has to do with popular mobilization. It's something I've been paying a lot of attention to with a colleague, Benjamin Press. Uh, we run something called the Carnegie Global Protest Tracker, uh, which tries to keep track of significant anti-government protests that are going on in the world. I read that section with particular interest. And I must admit, Stefan, I scratched my head about, I guess, two things in that section. One was categorizing mobilizations as either pro-democratic or pro-autocratic. I struggled with that bifurcation because what we find is a lot of popular mobilizations against governments would be hard to categorize as one or the other. For example, recent protests in Sri Lanka about economic measures uh, by the government uh, protests often explode around economic triggers in Chile 2019. Um, and they're not per se pro-democratic or pro-autocratic. They're people who are very dissatisfied with certain aspects of their life. The Yellow Vest movement in France, was that pro-democratic or pro-autocratic? Um, so I'm a little bit confused about how you can divide up popular mobilizations into one or the other. And then I guess I'd say that our impression, or not just impression, what we find in the tracker is actually for us a more striking trend rather than your argument that sort of pro-democratic mobilization is, is either on decline or being outweighed by pro-autocratic is that when significant episodes of autocratization burst out in a country, um, there are often public protests against them, quite significant ones. And to us, that's a significant, significant reality in today's world. Think of Myanmar when they carried out the coup, Belarus when Lukashenko sort of cracked down, El Salvador what the president's been doing in responses to it, Slovenia there have been protests, India, I mean there's many more, I have a list here, Serbia, significant protests, um, and so on uh, around such episodes. So, so two comments in other words, one is tell me a little bit more about this classification, pro-democratic, pro-autocratic, and then isn't the reality that when autocratizers really try to push things hard, they often face protests, and that's a very significant political reality. Mm. Yeah. So when we measure mobilization, um, we we measure both mobilization in general, just how much uh, protest and mobilization has there been uh, in the past year, uh, but also then have two specific questions: one on mobilization for democracy and mobilization for autocracy, and and that's defined, uh, and so we, and these are expert coded, right? So we rely on our experts. Again, it's not me or somebody else sitting in Gothenburg and deciding this. Um, and, but we, we tell the experts that events are pro-democratic if they're organized with the explicit aim to advance and or protect democratic institutions, such as free and fair elections uh, and so on. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's very explicit that we ask them to code to the extent to which the mobilization that occurred was this uh, for for democracy or then for autocracy uh, the other way around. Um, and of course, there's some noise here, uh, like with any measurement, um, uh, 
but but we think it's important to try and track also the mobilization, not the least the mobilization for autocracy, because we've also seen we didn't go so much into detail in the in the report here, but uh, we have um, among our postdocs and former postdocs like uh, Sebastian Hellmeyer, who is now at VCB in 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 Berlin, uh, looking at how. Uh, autocrats and wannabe autocrats are increasingly also using mobilization uh, uh, for their aim, like whipping up um, mass protests uh, to demonstrate that they have support. Um, and that's another tool in their toolbox for furthering autocratization. And that's what we, uh, uh, one of the things that we wanted to mm, be able to track with this. Okay, yeah. One more point, I wanna make sure we leave some time for Saskia and for the, the audience to take part. So I'll just, I'll try to get to the essence. The, the title of the report, Autocratization, Changing Nature, question mark. You know, your big theme is, is, is autocratization changing? And if so, how? And you, you highlight three, the coups, polarization, and disinformation. I, again, I was back to scratching my head here on this because I, First, with the coups, I felt like a little bit of the Seychelles, India problem. That yeah, there have been some coups in a, a number of African countries plus Myanmar, but to call it an epidemic mm, doesn't strike me as an epidemic. It's a, a limited outbreak in a certain number of countries with a relatively small population, and I'm, I'm a little hesitant to draw a global trend out of what we saw last year. But more importantly, what I was really struggling with analytically, Stefan, and help me here is that. Polarization and disinformation. I guess if I ask myself the question of is autocratization sort of somehow different than it used to be in whatever times? Is there some kind of new authoritarianism out there? Polarization is a consequence in many cases, um, like India and Brazil and uh, in many other places where polarization is rising to toxic levels, a result of, you know, illiberal and highly divisive projects by certain leaders who divide their country. Think of Modi in India, who, you know, push a certain political project. It's highly divisive and they drive it, as you say. And that's, that's kind of what autocrats do. And so the fact that a consequence of autocratization is polarization, I couldn't really understand how that means autocratization is changing its nature. That's, you know, Adolf Hitler was a pretty polarizing leader too. A lot of polarization in Germany in the 1930s. Um, you know, a lot of uh, autocrats tend to polarize their countries because they drive a political project and, and break things apart a little bit. So how is that changing nature or is it just there's a lot more autocratization happening? So there's a lot more polarization, mm. kind of my conclusion. And then similarly on disinformation, propaganda has been the, you know, one of the dark arts of autocrats from time immemorial. The Soviet Union spent 70 years lying to its people and perfecting forms of disinformation as has North Korea and autocrats everywhere. And so I, disinformation or the use of disinformation misinformation is a cardinal characteristic of autocratic regimes and processes of autocratization. So how does that, why is that changing nature? Again, a lot more of it happening. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of autocratization. So I was a little bit puzzled by the title of your report. Is it, is autocratization really changing no more or is it just a lot more of it is happening? Get used to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, to begin with, I completely agree with you about the, the struggling with this, and that's hence the question mark. Um, and in the end, we decided to go with this title and put put this message out there. Um, but but the intention was maybe we should have be clear about that. I, intention was not to say that the autocratization that we see now is different from anything we've ever seen before in history, like. I think it reminds a lot more about the 1930s that you also mentioned um, than, than, than uh, one would like, if I put it that way. Um, so it's more in, in relation to what we've seen over the past 20 years and this sort of building of this third wave of autocratization starting around 2000 or whenever we want to date it. And it's been very, for many years, very incremental. It's been sort of law abiding. Uh, Erdogan in Turkey never sort of uh, broke the constitution or anything. He changed it three times via referendum, right? <laughs> and it's been incremental, gradual, piece by piece, sort of very, uh, what should I say, uh, a little bit 
hesitant, or if I use that word, or or, or at least careful. And what we saw now, we think, is this more bold action and pushing polarization to really these high toxic levels, becoming much more sort of open and 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 um, mm. uh, and and radical with the misinformation. Um, and and I agree with you that one year of of increased number of coups is is not a trend. That's just like uh, maybe a wake up call possibly. Um, and the endemic uh, use of endemic that was the UN Secretary General that we cited. But <laughs> the, so I, I kind of agree with that. It's we, we we wanted to be a little careful with saying we not, but maybe we were not careful enough in the wording in the report. Your comments suggest that. Uh, so so that's that's I apologize for that. But the mm -hmm. the I think we wanted to put up a warning sign and say, hey, it looks like. Even if some of these changes have been going on for a while, there is some sort of, you know, even if you get more of a degree, at some point it becomes a difference in kind. Yeah. Um, and that at least we are maybe moving towards that and that we see a dangerous signs of a dangerous development where wannabe autocrats don't care what democracy say anymore. That kind of thing. Yeah, that's a helpful clarification. So, Askia, um, those are the, that's what I have for now. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, let me come in with one question before we turn it um, to some of the questions coming in from the audience. So, I'm um, one thing I've been puzzling uh, with a little bit hearing you talk is is kind of the broader question of of, of drivers and whether there is really a single phenomenon happening happening here because the report does such a good job laying out these global patterns, right, and global trend lines. On the other hand, when you dig deeper, you do see very different phenomena in many ways. You see, you know, what's happening in the United States is very different from the increasing repression that's happening in China versus the military coups that, that Tom just talked about. Um, and I think in some ways, that's always the struggle with trying to understand democratization, autocratization. You see these global waves um, that suggest there's a unified phenomenon. But on the other hand, if you dig deeper, you see these multiple really complex factors that are causing developments in, in single countries. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that tension, right, yeah. between broader explanations and then more context specific explanations and whether you see sort of different schools of thoughts emerging about about what's actually happening here, or do we have some sort of consensus? And maybe this is for both of you to, to talk a little bit about what's our current uh, understanding of the phenomenon and what's driving it. Um, should I go first, Tom, or you want to? Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, no, uh, Saskia, I think this is the $1 billion question or whatever. It used to be some, some other denomination, a TV program <laughs> 50 years ago. but. Um, but I, 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 you know, there are certainly uh, contextual, country-specific uh, factors and and drivers at play. Uh, that's that's sort of always the case. But when you see a global trend that affects all world regions and countries at all kinds of different levels of democracy, different levels of economic development, different, we can go down the line then there must also be some global drivers, right? There must also be some factors. And I think some of the countries that you mentioned are not, not completely um, unrelated to each other. Um, uh, China's increasingly aggressive stance, not the least since Xi came into power, um, and their uh, aggressive, more and more aggressive campaign for furthering their model of development in the world across in Africa and in Asia and so on, and putting all wrenches they can into the machinery for democracies in all international organizations. Nobody in the UN dares to even use the word democracy anymore, as long as China is in the room. Um, and they're attacking of journalists all over the world. I mean, they are attacking local newspapers in small little towns in Sweden. What do you think they do in the rest of the world? Right? That it's so, and that's not unrelated to what's happening. I think in with the, the sort of the the pullback for democracy elsewhere, and same with Russia. I mean, Putin's campaign for uh, spreading nationalist, reactionary, uh, and anti-democratic uh, 
uh, uh, ideologies, if you like, and support leaders and small groups, also financially. He's supporting those kinds of movements and parties all across Europe as well. Any intervention in your guys' election, <coughs> in Brexit and so on. So what's happened in Russia, and of course, it has not only impacted on the former Soviet states and parts of uh, Eastern Europe, coasting up with, with uh, Orban in Hungary and so on, but also affecting and, uh, the, the, the sort of established democracy, so-called in, in Western Europe uh, for a long time. And then you've had Saudi Arabia that spread its its version of, of Islam, Salafism, uh, across the world since the mid-late 1980s. Um, and, and see the problems in Indonesia now, right? Uh, Salafism used to be this tiny little uh, part of Islam that, that didn't mean anything for the world. Uh, and now it does, and it's clearly anti-democratic. Uh, and so there are, num I think there are a, a number of of, of sort of global forces, including then sort of these non-state actors that spread anti-democratic, generally speaking, and often nationalist, reactionary, and coupling it with conspiracy theories across the world. I mean, they have QAnon problems in Germany, huge now. It, it's, these are also becoming global uh, with the use of internet and all that. And, and, and all this is, is so, there are global forces as well as these um, country-specific ones, I think. Yeah. Maybe just one minute on that, then let's, I'm sure we're eager to get to the questions from the audience. Is I agree, there's certainly some facilitating or to some extent driving factors that are transnational in nature, such as Stefan mentions, the reach of a number of authoritarian powers across borders is very troubling. But I think there are some important distinctions in the domestic driver, Saskia, that, that one should get at. I mean, in, in gross terms, fairly autocratic regimes that then hardened themselves, like China starting in the early 2000s, which went from very limited kind of flexibility to an authoritarian hardening, is a different phenomenon to me than what we see in many of the large countries that became somewhat democratic in the 80s and 90s, but then have really struggled, like say Brazil or Turkey, where I think the drivers are different. And I, or I think what you see in those cases is uh, citizens very dissatisfied in some ways with what they had, uh, like in Brazil, anger at the ruling class because of corruption and other problems and the openness of the population to a illiberal populist who comes in from outside the system. And so you have a kind of paper that uh, I'm working on with my colleague Ben Press on grievance field illiberalism of a leader who comes in, you know, and says, this is, the system isn't working. I'm going to have to break it to, to get you the answers you want. Um, and Modi and Erdogan in their own ways have played on grievances in the society about uh, exclusion or inclusion and things like that. And so the failure of a number of somewhat democratic countries in the global south you know, sliding back in some ways is a very different thing that has to do with, I think, you know, the difficulty of consolidating democracy in countries that have attempted it and gotten a certain way, but very weak, as opposed to authoritarian hardening in other countries, which I think is a somewhat distinct phenomenon and isn't driven in China by grievances in the 2000s by Chinese disappointment in the system, but rather an illiberal project of President Xi and a feeling that he needed to do that to ensure continued rule of the Communist Party because of his calculation of domestic dynamics and other things. So I think there are some big differences among the cases, even when we have the transnational factors that are kind of behind. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in from the from the audience. Perhaps um, an initial one um, asked by Sanjay uh, Ruparilia, um, asking about what's really surprising here about what we're seeing, right? Um, versus what is maybe more expected. And he uh, suggests that maybe one of the most surprising trends is actually the, the backsliding in supposedly consolidated democracies, that that is maybe something we didn't really expect. 20 years ago. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect on that. Um, I'll also add a, a second question, maybe in, in the interest of time, asked by Bill Wanlund um, about the current Russian um, aggression against Ukraine. So he asked whether 
um, what the implications of that are for the global state of democracy and autocracy. And is it possible that there's actually sort of a renewed appreciation for democracy in light of what's been happening in Ukraine? Stefan, why don't you take it first? Okay. Uh, what, I think there are many reflections, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could talk uh, on a whole hour about the established democracies only. It's, 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 it's really um, uh, important that we, we spend a lot of research going forward and in disentangling what's going on there. But I think one reflection I want to make that I think uh, at least affects also the established democracies and is going to be a challenge for democracy, even if we survive now, this current wave of, of autocratization. I've said now a couple of times, I'll say it again, democracy dies with the lies. The whole system that democracy is, is based on accountability between voters, citizens, and their elected leaders, and then horizontal accountability between that checks on, on the executive and so on. Now, if with the use of, of internet, but also increasingly traditional media and so on, uh, leaders can get away with lie after lie after lie, and people are, are, are deceived to believe in conspiracy theories and God knows what. Um, that whole accountability breaks down. Democracy cannot stand on a foundation of lies. It needs truth. Um, and, and that's a huge challenge. And I think one of the areas that is making some of the established democracies really struggle. I think that was very, it's very palpable in the United States and a, a big threat to, to democracy in the United States going forward, but also other places, including my own country. Um, on the Ukraine, I would just say very quickly that, that I think that if there is a silver lining here, it is that at least I've, I've, I've felt that European leaders and, and also European sort of think tanks and all that, everybody sort of it made them sit up and realize that the threat to democracy is real uh, and very concrete. Uh, and right now it's Ukraine, but it could be us next. And that can maybe galvanize the democracies and pro-democratic actors, hopefully across both the global north and the south uh, to act more coherently together and stand up more together for each other uh, going forward. Tom, would you like to come in? Well, now? time is short. Why don't you go ahead and take another question or two? Yeah. All right. Um, Heather Grabby asks, do innovation in, innovations in democratic practice right, like citizens' assemblies, for example, offer some hope for greater mobilization because there may be harder also for autocrats to manipulate than elections, for example. Stefan, here, please. Yeah. Uh, this is, I must admit, this is really not my area with the, these sorts of democratic innovations. Um, mobilization in favor of democracy is good. Anything that can uh, help stimulate that uh, is good. Um, Participation in general is good, uh, and and democratic learning in those contexts and it, it tends to be good. Um, we know that mobilization is popular mobilization is one of the things that can really push back against autocratization. Uh, it can also make uh, existing autocracies fall. Uh, so it's a powerful force. Um, the innovations area is 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 something I I know too little about that I I I don't feel. But maybe you, Tom, have have. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have some better insights here. No, just one observation I'd make from the United States is you know uh, the relationship between national action and local action. Look at school boards today and the debates going on in our country. Quite harsh debates, divisive debates over school control and curriculum in schools and book banning and all of that. What's striking is you have this decentralized network of school boards all around the country in locally or state managed schools, uh, yet it becomes a national phenomenon and manipula manipulated by information providers nationally who inject information, sometimes lies, into this debate. And so unfortunately, even a local school board in you know rural X state 
uh, finds itself immediately part of a national effort to influence opinions and a national debate over things. So the idea that a local assembly can necessarily be more isolated from disinformation, from kind of polarization in the United States, at least, it's been hard to establish that. Unfortunately, we're running towards the end of our time together. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank, first of all, Stefan for joining us for the incredible work he and his team are doing every year to put together this, this really great resource for researchers, but also just interested um, policymakers and citizens around the world, and for, for presenting it here today. I think uh, there's so much there to discuss. I think we could keep talking for quite, a, quite some time. Um, and also thank you to you, Tom, for offering some really probing questions about, you know, the concepts and, and the phenomenon we're discussing here. I think it's a very rich discussion. And thank you all in the audience for joining, for engaging and participating. Um, we hope you enjoyed the debate and um, wish you all the best. Okay. All right. All the best. Thanks, Saskia. Uh, thanks, Saskia. <laughs>